Hello and welcome back and that is right today we're going to return to the subject of Gen 4 SSDs with a very unusual little drive. One that when it arrived here in the studio, I'm not going to say I dismissed it, but I will say that the Lexar NM790 at a casual glance was not an SSD that was pulling my chain. But the more I read up about it, the more I learned about this drive in preparation for this review, suddenly I started noticing just how chuffing unique this drive is. And in today's review, we're going to talk about the hardware, we're going to be putting it for its paces for with a benchmark, but more than anything else, I want to talk about why this drive represents a very different changing time in the world of SSDs, with Gen 5 SSDs knocking around right now, starting to really stretch their muscles, thank you very much, CES 2024, releasing a dozen of those, um, but at the same time, in an oversaturated marketplace of Gen 4 SSDs out there, why this drive manages in many strange, I would say very tech-verse ways, to stand out from the crowd. So let's straight away go um, into this drive itself. It is uh, available in 1TB, 2TB, and 4TB configurations at $64, $169, and $299. There is a heatsink version available, as you can see here, but you can also get it without the heatsink. I wouldn't recommend that for reasons that will make uh, themselves clear later on. This happens to be the 4TB model. If we open this bad boy up and have a little look inside, We've got a little bit of warranty information there. Again, five years warranty. And you've got the little plastic chassis there holding our drive inside. Now, again, there should be images on screen throughout the course of this video where I'm going to show off a lot more of the hardware specifications. But the heatsink is, you know, let's be frank, very, very generic. Um, it's not really anything outspoken to look at there. It's got that ridge design there at the top. It's fairly standard, not dissimilar to that of your $15, $20 um, M2-2280 uh, heatsink that you find in the marketplace. So what is it about this drive that stood out for me? Well, again, things are going to get nerdy, strap in. Uh, with the performance numbers uh, rated there at 7,400 megabytes per second over 6,500 megabytes per second, you would be forgiven for thinking, well, who gives a shiz? All the other Gen 4 drives in the market right now are promoting those numbers. What on earth sets this apart from those? Well, two things. Number one, this is a DRAMless drive. This is a drive that does not have memory on board. And if you've been following DRAMless SSDs over the last couple of years, particularly in Gen 4 and Gen 5, you'll know that DRAMless drives take advantage of something called HMB, Host Memory Buffer. That is when a small portion of memory on your host client OS system, your Windows, your Mac system, your whatever, <coughs> allow the drive to utilize that instead of onboard NAND. That allows manufacturers to use fewer components on the board and uh, save a little bit of money but also allow dissipation of heat to be much better managed across the PCB allowing more space for those big chunky NAND modules which brings us to the other reason this drive is interesting the controller inside originally I was like yeah it's the Fizon everyone's using the Fizon it's the Fizon E18 the most common SSD controller in the market however it turns out that is not the case this uses a controller that I had never heard of Maxiotech MAP1602A Falcon Light a real catchy name but why that's interesting is it's a um, NAND controller that really goes its own way when you compare it against the Inno grits out there, the likes of that Fison controller. Rocking out the gate, um, a 32-bit ARM um, R5 architecture, not dissimilar to that of the Fison controllers. It then doubles down on that by supporting, although fewer channels of uh, the NAND than other controllers out there, such as the Fison E18, which is an eight channel, 1600 MTS mega transfers per second controller, this, on the other hand, only has four channels, but those channels are 2,400 uh, mega transfers per second. That is what you find currently in the Gen 5 arena of SSDs. Moreover, from that, this arrives with that NAND, and it is a YMTC 232-layer NAND, and that's 3D TLC memory. Again, this is one of very, very few Gen 4 SSDs in the market that has taken advantage of such a higher layer count NAND. On top of that, it's a DRAMless drive, which generally is associated with higher temperatures, lower durability, and lower performance. Yet, it's DRAMless with performance numbers that challenges that of RAM equipped drives uh, with that performance of 70,400 over 6,500 megabytes per second. But on top of that, has reported 4K read IOPS of a million. And the right IOPS at 900,000, 
which are way higher than I would say 70 to 80% of all the Gen 4 drives in the market. And again, this is using a controller that few people use and using NAND of sufficiently higher quality than anyone else out there. And it gets even better. The drive arrives with 0.5 drive rights per day durability. Doesn't sound like a lot. 0.5, that's half the capacity of the drive in terms of rewrite every single day. But then when you realize the majority of Gen 4 SSD drives on the market, again, that have DRAM, are rated at 0.3 to 0.38 drive rights per day. That means this drive is higher in durability regardless of that lack of DRAM on board. So yes, you're going to be reliant on host memory buffer, which can be problematic if you're using an OS that does not have host memory buffer support or it affords the ability for the drive to take advantage of it but at the same time it still is a drive that is making incredibly bold promises on an architecture that by all rights it should not have the ability to perform upon so again well uh, i'm sure on screen we've showed the controller we've showed the nand and all that on screen but i think what you want to see is this thing put through its paces we will be putting it inside a ps5 soon to see just how well it deals with that scenario because if you look out the front it does make a point of highlighting what it can do but a playstation does not support host memory buffer so it's going to be interesting to see for that future video whether this drive cuts mustard but let's head over to the test machine and put this drive through its paces and see if this DRAMless out there controller ssd can actually deliver on such bold promises finding ourselves here on the desktop of my test machine we can see here crystal disk has got this drive recognized straight off the bat we've been testing this drive on a gen 4 times 4 connection that is the full bandwidth afforded to this drive here we've been testing for a little over an hour and overall i'm quite pleased with the results there's a couple of dipping points but not too many now again this is a drive that i would argue has you know been built with maybe playstation 5 and gaming in mind so do bear in mind that the testing that we're going to be talking about today is synthetic testing but we will be doing those tests of this drive in a ps5 very very soon but for now let's crack on with the results now i think it's important while we look at the results that we see the temperatures because remember this is a drive that's rocking out the gate with a heatsink pre-attached and i'm pleased to say that at the busiest test period this was the atto disbenchmark testing the drive reached a total 57 degrees which again for a drive is pretty darn good there would have been no throttle in there and that was a fairly heavy test so although the drive itself isn't the coolest drive i've ever seen it is by no means the highest there now moving forward from that sorry got a bit of a cold at the moment uh, we can have a look at the first range of results dipping first into crystal disc mark and as you can see here we've gone for a one gig four gig 16 gig and 64 gigabyte test file and in practically every single result we saw that seven gigabytes or 7000 megabytes per second get broken through in sequential read again artificial results but still nonetheless they although synthetic are still very good guidelines of the capability of this drive in the right setup now as you can see 7100 7100 7100 indeed the only one that didn't quite hit those dizzy heights was the 64 gig massive file now none of this testing hit the reported 7400 this drive is capable of however if you did dig into uh, the inclusive uh, benchmark details that arrive with this drive and on the website, you will notice straight away that those performance measurements utilize an AMD Ryzen 9, I believe, uh, CPU, which is just not this system. We're using an Intel 12th um, Gen I believe i5 uh, cpu here this integrated graphic cpu so no inclusive graphics card on top of that 16 gig of ddr5 memory and on top of that is a windows 10 pro machine there so we were never really going to have the capability to hit those numbers but the rest of the numbers are pretty darn good with the 4k random iops uh, read just shy of a million there at uh, 930,000 and largely sitting in that range uh, once again until we got to the 64 gig file where unfortunately we did encounter that oversaturation which is all too common when it comes to a lot of SSDs. Now these are all still synthetic results but good guidelines how about atto disk benchmark well while i do that one i think what we should do is run ourselves another sneaky little test here in the background we're going to go for a 5k red file crack it down to 4 gig we're going to make sure we use the ssd once again we're just going to run that there in the background just for a nice static straight out of the gate speed test there not too shabby 
But again, remember AJA and the way it's built and the complexity of those files is not the same as those linear tests we just did. But over to Atto. Now bring in the Atto test results here on screen. Again, very positive numbers. Do keep in mind that these are test results based strictly on gigabytes, not the thousands of megabytes we saw, and therefore the calculation can be ever so slightly different. But nonetheless, these consistent tests here did give us quite comparable numbers on the uh, quarter of a gig, that's 256 megabytes, one gig and four gig test parameters for these benchmarks here and fairly consistent across the different block sizes there and indeed if we flick over to the IOPS although these aren't strictly the same as the IOP numbers we saw on those 4k randoms there from crystal disk from earlier there's still pretty good guidelines for the capabilities of this drive here on this gen 4x4 lane that it's been connected into there uh, most of these are linked below along with a few other tests over on NAS compares on the written article but I've got to say right now I like the results I'm seeing here both in terms of sequential performance and that of 4k random iops if we come out of that one there we can make our way to as ssd again another ssd benchmarking tool that kind of has its own algorithm of choice there broken across all the different parameters and as you can see there you can you know largely overlook the fact that it seems like it's a thousand maybe in some cases 1500 megabytes per second lower than the comparative testing on crystal disk but these are more ssd specific and you can configure them a little bit more overall i would say straight away those are still good numbers to put those into a wee bit of perspective if we go into our test history here we look for another 4tb gen 4 ssd i would say this one here is a great example the samsung 990 pro 4tb a more expensive drive the the one we're looking at, at here and if we go for some of the comparative numbers here and we look at uh, the performance numbers here of a one gig file side by side you can see straight away that sustain number is actually lower Overall, it's still a higher score for the more expensive drive, but it was kind of surprising that number was as low as it was. And indeed, when we go into the other performance numbers there, it's still a higher scoring number for the Samsung because we are comparing a more expensive drive with a uh, hosted controller inside with a higher IOPS. But overall, still pretty reasonable numbers overall when putting them on a side-by-side -side basis there. Another 4TB drive, if we were to look through our archive here, we could probably find another semi-decent uh we can go for the 8TB drive, for example. So the 8TB drive from Adlink here is another great example of a drive side by side with this one. And again, it may seem like this one is low on the overall score, and indeed it is, but that is because of the increased um, IOPS potential of that large capacity drive, and it still matches it like for like on those read write figures overall. And same goes if we dig in to uh, the traditional performance there of Crystal Disk that we mentioned earlier on, we can see that indeed the consistent performance is actually higher on uh, this drive here than it was uh, higher on the Lexar I should say than it was on that Adlink ATB drive as well despite the larger amount of NAND afforded to that uh, Adlink drive overall there so I would say the performance numbers although they are not out of this world I will say for a gen 4 SSD in this price packet they're still pretty darn good Overall, I'd say the Lexar NM790 at 4TB and at that price point is pretty darn reasonable. It's just a shame that it's arriving on quite a crowded marketplace now. Um, had it arrived maybe even a year and a half ago, I know this isn't strictly a new, new drive, but it is still a drive that has arrived on the scene at a very busy time when there are a lot of competitive 4TB Gen 4 SSDs in the market. It is a good SSD. It maintained a very good temperature for our testing. The performance numbers did stand up, and I think a more power a user, uh, high-end gamer systems, the numbers would certainly be higher, and it did deliver on everything Letzar was saying that the MN790 is capable of. However, with Gen 5 now starting to establish itself, and although we can't really quite yet fully utilize gen 5 ssd architecture there is still question marks about whether buying it right now at the beginning of 2024 whether it is best to go for this drive with a higher uh, value in terms of performance versus capacity or make the jump towards gen 5 i think a lot of users it's going to come down to the future proofing and i think if you're looking for a gen 4 drive i can't think of many reasons not to go for this drive but for you gen 5 users maybe hold out just a fraction longer but thank you so much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this. Let me know in the comments if you have. If you need further assistance on choosing the right SSD for your for your gaming, for your editing suite, or for your NAS or more, 
then use the comment section or the free advice section over on NAS Compares. If you do want to learn more, you can always subscribe or use one of our many outlets, uh, utilize the membership program of Ko-Fi. You can go over to Patreon and take advantage of expedited support and monthly Zooms. But apart from that, thank you so much for watching today's review and I'll see you next time.